half years there. Uh, I'm now uh, working in this startup called Casa One. This was my first startup experience, and I'll elaborate on that in the later part. Okay, so I'm going to sort of talk about my career and break it down into three major portions. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, the first job, and then second job, and Casa One. Uh, but because we're in a professional setup, I thought, you know, we'll give it some fancy names. First one's called Rolling Stone. Uh, second one is my discovery phase, and the final part of it is actualization. Okay, so for me to get into how I started at Infosys, I think we need to take a little bit of a step back and talk about my engineering and how I decided what to do. Um, I was, I did my engineering biotech, and unlike most of my other four, um, classmates, I was one of the few people who had actually opted to do biotech. Most of them were there because I couldn't find anything else. No offense meant to anybody in that classroom. Um, but in my head, I had this dream of you know, uh, being somebody, a, a mad scientist kind of a person who would discover cancer cures, who could uh, you know, create new species through genetic modification, etc. Three semesters into the course, I realized I hated working inside a laboratory. Instantly, my decision changed, changed and I said, okay, yeah, yeah, if I can't work in biotech, I'm going to become a bioinformatician, which is essentially a marriage of biology through computers. Um, I did everything I thought made sense. Uh, I did an internship in a bioinformatics lab. Um, I did my final year project as a bioinformatician. And uh, during my fourth year, when companies came to sort of uh, for recruitment, uh, I instantly sat down for an ID job, and there you have it. Within like two days, I had a result, and I uh, was recruited into Infosys. Um, the reason why I'm sort of bringing this up is because I decided to go ahead and join Infosys at that point in time. Um, there was nothing written in stone for me. It was the convenient path for me to take. Uh, I didn't have to study. I didn't have to put in any effort. I didn't have to apply my brains. Infosys came. I got selected, and I just decided, you know what? Let me do this for six months, and after that, we we'll figure out what to do next. Which is why this this part of my career I call the rolling stone because I just went with the flow. I didn't stop to think. I didn't stop to sort of evaluate my options because something fell into my lap. I decided to go ahead and deal with it, right? Uh, I kept telling myself before I went in that this is just going to be a six-month vacation person. Uh, the six months actually ended up lasting all of four years. Um, so uh, I, 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 I kind of summarize at the end why I'm telling you guys this story, but we'll come to that uh, after part two. So uh, towards the end of third year uh, at Infosys, I realized that um, I wasn't feeling very challenged. I, I felt like I had stagnated in my career. And I also started getting a little disillusioned in thinking that I really don't want to be in the IT sector anymore. I started looking around, uh, I started applying for jobs without any talking to people, without any getting any guidance, without getting any, any form of mentorship. I was really I knew what I wanted in life, which was not to be in IT. Uh, the only problem with what I was doing is I was still applying to IT companies. I was still applying to other companies as QOs. And what ended up happening in that was that I was getting jobs as a QO. Uh, and I was, I was pretty disenchanted by all of it. And in my head, magically, you know, one day I wake up and this idea pops up that I should consider doing an MBA. Um, I started looking around and I applied for an MBA. And unfortunately, the first school that accepted me was giving me an MBA in IT and strategy. Um, again, I didn't think about going out there, putting myself out there, talking to people, doing any format of research. I magically decided, okay, you know what? Not this MBA, I need to figure out something else. So I started looking around and then I came across this one school that I thought made sense for me. And uh, I applied to that one school and that was the only school that I applied to. Uh, lucky for me, I got through. And in my head, uh, I started dreaming. I started thinking that, you know what? Now that I'm in this school, life is going to change. I'm going to get access to some magic beans. Uh, I'm going to get some uh, idea of what I want to do in life. I'm going to meet interesting people. And hopefully I'm going to partner with some interesting people and end up doing something completely outside of the world of IT and make something out of my life. So that's the dream that I went into uh, my MBA with. Um, one year passed by, and again, it was placement season, and I had zero idea what I wanted to do in life. Um, and as luck would have it, of all the companies that I applied to, there was just one company that wanted to talk to me, and that was the only company that wanted to give me a job. And as you guys already know, it was another IT company, right? So now why am I talking about this part of my life? Uh, I want to sort of highlight here that you know, 
it's okay to be confused. I started off thinking I wanted to be a biotechnologist. I changed my plans and I said, okay, maybe I want to be a bioinformatician. Okay? And when the opportunity sort of presented itself, I said, okay, let me give this a shot. Um, I don't think, you know, anytime when you look back and if somebody ever asked me, hey, what do you want to do with yourself or what is it that you would like to do in your life, I never have an answer. In fact, if you were to ask me what I want to do for the next five years of my life, I would not have an answer for you even today, right? So had somebody told me this, had somebody given me this insight, let's say, 10 years back and said, you know what, you're not alone in this, there are other people out there who think exactly the same way, I would have probably felt a little better about myself and I would have learned to approach life a little differently. So the biggest thing over here is like if you guys don't know what you want, if you're confused about your next steps, uh, you're not alone in this. All of us have felt that same way at some point of time in our lives. The second point I want to sort of highlight is don't settle. Uh, what I mean by that is if you're uncomfortable in the position that you are in, if you're uncomfortable in your current job, don't just keep on thinking of, you know, like, okay, you know, maybe another six months, I want to do this, this is fine, I keep on doing it. Uh, that is, that, that's not really going to help you get where you want to get. Um, and I know we generalize a little bit here, but I also feel as women, we are very scared of the unknown. For us, we feel like, okay, you know what? This is unknown evil. Let me deal with this, because I don't know what's going to happen if I change my job. I don't know if, let's say, I'm, 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 let's say I'm working at a, a large organization right now, if I quit, if I take a year off to study, if I take a year off to do an MBA, what happens if I don't get a job? Or what happens if I don't find something that I enjoy doing after? As women, we are okay doing with something that's in our life right now, which we probably don't enjoy, versus taking a risk for something that we don't know uh, is going to be, uh, I don't know, positive or negative for us. So these are the two large takeaways that I, ha I got when I look back on my life. And, um, uh, hopefully this is something that you guys can reflect on as well, uh, you know, whenever you're making decisions in the future. Um, so coming to the third phase, which is FASA 1, uh, I spent about two and a half years as a product manager uh, in this company called Endurance. And again, uh, around that same time, you know, work wasn't really moving fast. I think somebody mentioned a stat saying that 70% of projects actually don't see the light of day. And for me, in those two and a half years, 100% of my projects have not seen the light of day. And it was very frustrating. Uh, I've been trying to find a job for the longest time. And uh, I think I must have interviewed at about 15 to 20 companies. And I'm sure you all are aware of what it takes to take a product management interview, right? There are less than five or six months. And most of these companies, when they interview you, they will tell, tell you only after the last round whether you've been accepted or not. So after interviewing with so many companies and getting rejected, I was, I think, quite frustrated, which is when I decided, OK, I need a break. Uh, I'm going to take some time off. Uh, and I'm going to travel a bit or do whatever I'm going to do, and then come back and start on my job hunt. And I think that's been one of the best decisions I've ever taken in my life. Uh, and uh, I would highly recommend that if you guys are in a position where you're frustrated or you're stressed out and things are not working out for you and you're all over the place, take a step back, take a breather, even if it's just for a couple of weeks. Uh, unplug yourselves, take a break and try and figure out how things want to work out for you, right? Don't just keep running after something that uh, is just above the horizon that you're not able to catch hold of. So anyway, I ended up taking a break and luckily around that same time, uh, my, man my current manager, who I'd spoken with about two months earlier, reached out and, you know, started, uh, we started having a discussion about what it would mean for me to join Casa One. And Things worked out, uh, and I started at Casa One. A little bit of background, when I joined Casa One, it was a furniture rental company. I was the first product manager to join. Uh, we were about a team of 15 people in India. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened at Casa One. Uh, I, I think I got a lot of benefit from the fact that, you know, I started really early, the team was really small, and I got to go with the company. Okay. But I've tried to filter out my learnings from my journey here in a way that it applies to not just smaller teams, but also the larger teams. Some things that all of us can take away and apply to whatever it is that we're working. Right? So to begin with, uh, I'll, I'll paint a picture for you all. Uh, I started at Casa One as a senior PM. I spent about a year there uh, where I learned the ropes of the business. I spoke with people. I understood exactly what it meant to be on the ground getting your hands dirty. 
Uh, in the second year, uh, I started working as a director of product managers where I was sort of hiring teams. I was growing the organization. I was structuring different teams, trying to figure out what makes sense from an organizational standpoint. And around my fourth year, I took on additional responsibilities and I started uh, looking at marketing and content as well as product management. Right? So um, some of my learnings from Casa 1, uh, I've highlighted them over here. And again, uh, I'm going to share some examples of uh, what I mean when I say some of these things. Um, and hopefully they're replicable across larger teams. Um, so the first thing that worked really well for me was getting my team's trust in. So when I started out, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were working in the co-working space. Uh, we had one large table to ourselves, and the entire team used to sit around that table. So essentially what would happen is, you know, if I had a question, somebody else had a question, it was pretty easy to collaborate with the team. Um, essentially, because of that kind of a setup, what, I, what ended up happening was I had a lot of access to information. I understood the business really quickly. Uh, I could, you know, reach over, reach over and talk to my customer success manager and ask him, you know, what, what, what do you mean? What is this customer's problem? Why are they writing in? Why do they have so many problems? Uh, I could talk to my operations people and you know, figure out what's going on in the operations side of things. So essentially, uh, having that kind of a setup helped. And uh, one of the things that I did uh, very early on was gather as much knowledge about the business, about people's pain points, about uh, you know people's day to day as I could. And essentially, what that translated into was every time I would walk into a meeting, I already knew what to expect from that meeting. Uh, people would, uh, you know, other people would be kind of lost in the blue, not really knowing, uh, you know, what is happening on the uh, operation side. So let's say if, if it's a team with the customer success team, they may not really know what's happening on the ops side because they haven't bothered to look in and check in with them. Or let's say if you're meeting with the engineering manager. They, don't, they have no clue what's happening outside of the engine meeting, right? So I think when you sort of spend some time try to understand different aspects of the business, when you try and understand different uh, uh, reasons of for you for being uh, in a particular meeting, when you walk into the meeting, people automatically start looking up to you. People automatically expect you to know things and to help, right? Um, and I think that has really helped uh, a lot along the way. So I'll say that within, I think, just about two to three months from people reaching out to my boss for information, uh, uh, you know, across the organization, my boss used to be the central point of contact for everything related to class and one, people started reaching out to me. People will ask me, you know what, uh, I'm facing trouble in this uh, area, could you help me out? Or who should I talk to if I want to get XYZ things sorted? So, you know, very naturally, the point of contact switched from my boss to me, and very naturally, it freed up my boss's time to do what he wanted to pursue, right? So, one of the things I would sort of highly recommend is anytime you're going for a meeting, anytime you're going to have a discussion with a peer, Make sure you're prepared. Don't go blindly and expect someone to give you, you know, a lowdown on what's expected while they're in the meeting. Um, the second part I think I've covered a little bit is we work with the team. Uh, I think uh, somebody here mentioned that you know you don't have authority and you still have to get work done from your team members. Now when you're joining a new team. Uh, don't expect, like I've seen a lot of new product managers just walk into a room like they own the place, strut around with an attitude and say, hey, you know what, I want this done today and I want it done now, right? Um, that's not going to fly. You, they don't work for you, they work with you. So you really need to understand that part of it. Uh, and it's not just your engineering team, it's also your stakeholders, right? So especially, I think my biggest advice to new PMs is when you start working as uh, you know, in any new team, make sure that you win their trust. Make sure that um, you basically help them understand that what you're doing is going to help them in the long run and it's not the other way around. If an engineer comes up to you and says, hey, I'm going to miss my deadline, I don't think we'll be able to do this by tonight, ask them why. Don't push back without understanding. Don't say that, no, we decided we're going to do it today. Try and understand what's going on. Maybe there's a personal issue that's at hand. Maybe there is, uh, you know, a scope problem. Maybe the scope wasn't well defined. Maybe there's some, uh, you know, other issue that can be solved that's coming in. So first of all, try and understand what's going on. Then try and help them with the solution, and then see if we can make it work. Right. So that is the second part. But I say work with the team, not uh, against the team. 
Uh, the last part, uh, again, I think this is a little subjective and it depends on the kind of teams that you are working with. But when you join a new team, you need to sort of uh, show quick and early wins. Um, so what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I, I know that sometimes when you join a project, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really long running project, probably takes about six to eight months for you to uh, get something out there. But if you can kind of find a small part of a problem to solve, or even if it's something as simple as, hey, you know, your fellow PM is stuck uh, on a solution, you're, you know, you're stuck uh, trying to get a buy-in from uh, stakeholders, or even if, let's say, your tech team is struggling with uh, a problem uh, to which nobody is able to find a solution, anything, like anywhere where you can sort of plug in and show some value, your team will automatically start looking up to and start uh, sort of reaching out to you whenever they're stuck, right? So it's, it's, it's a good strategy to sort of get in and try and figure out what are some small low-hanging fruits that you could get out of the way, small pain points that you can solve uh, for the larger group. So again, to summarize, uh, you need to earn trust early. If you're entering a new team, make sure that uh, you're earning people's trust and not just your tech team, not just your design team, your stakeholder trust as well. Uh, second part here is be curious. Um, what I mean by that is, whether it's a small organization or a larger one, don't box yourself out and say that this is the scope of my work or this is the limit of what knowledge I need. Right? Be curious. If you're sitting next to your customer support agent, try and understand what he's doing. Or let's say you're sitting, you know, you're seeing some finance issues. Maybe you're seeing multiple failed payments that are happening over and over again. Don't just assume it's a tech issue. Don't just assume that you know somebody's credit card is full. Look deeper into it. Figure out what's going on. Maybe there's a problem there. Maybe there's a solution which is waiting for you to be discovered, and nobody's even looking at it. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example. So somewhere around uh, our third year uh, at Casa One, uh, we started noticing that our conversion rates were not doing as well as they had been earlier, and. Uh, so we got you know, a lot of people coming down and saying, hey, what's going on? Earlier we were doing, let's say, X percent. Now we're only doing X minus Y percent. What is happening? Um, so you know, we started looking at different aspects of the problem. And one of the things we started to work on was uh, the performance marketing side of things. What that means is I started looking at the uh, acquisition channel. I wanted to see how we are driving traffic to the website and how it's impacting the conversion rates at our end. And uh, one of the things that happened was uh, I learned that I knew nothing about performance marketing. Uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with that term, but performance marketing is basically you know, uh, ads, Google ads, Facebook ads, uh, uh, Insta, whatever. Basically ads, uh, you can ca kind of club it under performance marketing. So I had zero idea what that was. So I started having regular catch-ups with the performance marketing team and uh, essentially expect them to tell me what's going on, uh, how they're solving problems, how are they driving traffic and all of that. So usually there was a lot of friction there. You know, they were like, why are you interfering in my work? What is your problem? Like, we're doing everything fine. But over time, when you realize that I'm not going to let them end the meeting till I have all the answers to my questions, they became more compliant and more helpful. And over time, we developed a really good relationship. Um, and long story short, we were able to sort of figure out that there was a bit of a mismatch in the messaging that was going out uh, on the acquisition channel versus the value that our customers were getting when they actually landed on the website. Right? So we fixed it, things worked out, etc. But uh, I think the biggest thing for me in all of this was the fact that I managed to learn a little bit about performance marketing. Uh, cut to two years later, um, but this is the sad part, a lot of my team was let go off and we didn't have a performance marketing manager anymore. But because I understood what it meant to be a performance marketer, I had been actively involved and I had also been working with the performance marketing team, giving them tips, uh, telling them that, hey, you know what, we are making XYZ changes on our website, why don't you guys make changes at your end? And collaborating with them, I eventually sort of fit into the role where my best felt that I would be a good fit to lead the team forward. Right, so this is one extreme example of what happens when you're curious. Um, but there can be other smaller wins as well. I mean, it doesn't always end up in, you know, you getting a new team or a new function. Uh, if you're sort of asking questions, I think you can end up with a lot more uh, uh, than you would if you sort of close yourself off in a box. Uh, the third point here is about taking ownership. I think as product managers, all of us do tend to take ownership. 
Uh, however, there is, uh, you know, uh, I think sometimes what happens is if there is a deadline that's been missed, or if, let's say, due to some external factors, uh, things didn't work out the way you planned them to work out, a lot of us tend to sort of make excuses. A lot of us say, yeah, you know what, uh, there was an outage on Slack, we couldn't do XYZ things because of that, and this is why this final outcome is not what we expected it to be. Um, don't do that, right? Own up. Uh, and when I say own up, it also ties back to this point of, hey, you know what, the buck stops with me. If you come to me with a problem, if I can't help you solve it, I will figure out how to do it so that you can do it, right? But I mean, don't be a problem finder, be a problem solver. So if you've identified a problem, make sure that you also find a solution to it and you help people. So to give you as an example, um, there's this one person in my company uh, who would constantly keep coming up and complaining about everything. You know, the way the system worked, the way the system didn't work, how much time it took for him to do XYZ things when the system didn't work. And every time he would come up to me, I would be like, no, but there's a solution for that. Have you tried it out? And invariably, it would be a no. And two days later, he would come back and start complaining about the same thing again. Okay? So don't be that person. One, you're not helping anyone. Everybody knows what the problems are highlighting. And Two, if you are that person who is good at identifying problems, find a solution to those problems. Don't just leave it at that, don't just go complain to somebody, come back and sit. Okay? Find a solution. Figure out how to fix it and fix it. It doesn't take a lot of time. And over time, what you really realize is that people will naturally start reaching out to you for help. And again, I mean, obviously, you don't want to be doing everybody's job, but you do end up being in a position where you can facilitate that they make their lives better. So, uh, that's what I mean when I say take ownership. Um, the last part is something that took me a long time to uh, learn, uh, which is basically learn how to manage up. Um, it's great that you have a team, you know, there's a lot of GAN out there which talks about how you manage your team, how you mentor your teams, etc. But nobody really tells you how to manage up. What I mean by that is you should be in a place or you should be in a position where you get to decide what you and your team does. Uh, and obviously, uh, within limited means, like obviously it, it should follow the vision of the company, the goal of the company, etc. Right? Uh, and typically, you don't want to be in a place where your manager is saying, hey, you know what, get this done. You should be in a place where you should have a plan. Hey, you know what, we had a town hall yesterday. Our current years or current quarter's goals have been discussed. And this is what I was thinking that we should be doing uh, for this quarter uh, based on XYZ data. You should be the ones going up to your bosses and saying, hey, you know what, this is what we will do. And have a constructive uh, conversation around it. Have, get their feedback, uh, understand what they think of uh, the plan that you've come up with. Maybe alter your plan, obviously, like you, you can't work in isolation, right? But at the same point, your bosses should be, your, your bosses need to feel confident that, hey, you know what, because I have this one person, my job is taken care of, and they're going to come back with a solid plan. I just need to look over it and tell them and give them some feedback and we'll fix it. Um, versus, you know what, hey, we had a town hall yesterday. I walk up to my boss and I say, boss, what is the plan for this quarter? And he has to sit down and write out the entire plan for me and I need to execute on it. You are no longer an executor. You are also a strategist. You have to plan for the future as well. Right? So, Take ownership, uh, learn to manage up, and do it in a way that your bosses feel empowered, they don't feel cornered. Um, and within learn to manage up, uh, there are two new points here, if you'll see. One is be consistent. Uh, I think one of my bosses' favorite anecdote is showing up is 80% of the work done. Uh, what we typically mean by that is, you know, if you set up some time, uh, and, you know, you set up some time for, let's say, 10 in the morning, make sure you're there at 10 in the morning and you come prepared. That's 80% of the battle won. Um, you know, when people have conversations and you're able to ask some intelligent questions, you're able to provide valuable input, that's 80% of your work done, right? So that's, that's what we mean when, when I say be consistent. The other part is communicate. Uh, I think a lot of us fail to sort of communicate the bad news. Uh, communicating the good and the bad news are both equally important. So hypothetically, if you have a launch that's planned for, let's say, next week, and you can already see this week, or let's say 10 days earlier, that that's not going to happen. Don't look for excuses. Don't look for a smart way out of it. We have not had that conversation. Tell your boss, hey, you know what? We plan to launch on the 21st. I don't think it's happening. Uh, and then tell them why do you feel it's not happening. We also maybe share a list of things that uh, went wrong. 
and how will you address them later. But the point is communication is essential. You shouldn't be telling your boss in the 20th that, hey, you know what, we are supposed to launch on the 21st, but we're not launching tomorrow because we're not ready. That communication needs to go out sooner. So that's what, uh, uh, you know, my key learnings have been at Casa One. Uh, I'm going to take a pause. Uh, if anybody has any questions or any inputs here before we move on. My developers are delayed because of that. It's really taking a lot of thought on me. Right. So how you are managing that? Yeah. So I think that's a great point. And I think I struggled with that same question for close to two years um, before I think I found a solution. So I'm going to share what I did with you. Uh, I think I had to support in my manager to hire teams. I don't know if you have that. Right. Uh, I had a team of about three to four teams reporting to me. And what I started to realize was that I'm not in this alone. It took me almost two years to come to that realization. And what I started to do was, you know what, uh, why don't you talk to Pushkar? He's the one handling this. Or why don't you talk to Pushkar? He's the one handling this, right? Um, initially, there was a little bit of a pushback. So what I would do is I would attend or I would be in the same meeting as these guys, but I would let them lead. Right? And over time, what started happening was that focus shifted from everybody coming to me to people going to my respective teammates and having that conversation. But again, this works if you have a team. Right? Uh, do you have a team? Like, do you have people who can help you? So uh, you can. And the challenge is in hiding as well, right? Yeah. So yeah. though we have that lever, but it's still your booking. The so I think what you need to do is you need to identify pockets where you can use people's help. Uh, we used to have ancillary teams for uh, certain tasks. So I would always take their help and say, hey, you know what, they'd be able to help you out. Or uh, not everything needs to be a tech solution, honestly. Like I've learned that pretty early that if somebody comes up to you with a problem, sometimes it's just a process problem. Just fix the process and it's done. Uh, maybe that's what you need to start doing. Start telling them that, hey, you know what? We can't do tech right now. We are not high in bandwidth. And then that's where your prioritization comes in. Okay? We don't have bandwidth, but why don't you check this out? Nine out of ten times, I'm seeing a simple Excel sheet solves a problem. Uh, use that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. So, yeah. Hi, another question, if time permits. Yeah. So, I had a very similar journey. Uh, uh, I've been a biotechnologist myself and same like yours. So I'm very glad that, you know, you shared your story. It was very, very relatable. So my question is coming from a biotechnology background and as a PM, as my already said, it's very important to stay updated with respect to technology, right? So how did you keep up with that? And, and did you do any kind of upskilling for your technical, uh, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, when you say technology, I'm going to assume you're talking more in terms of emerging tech uh, or yes, not yes. in terms of, let's say, coding or new languages, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, keeping abreast is about reading a lot. Um, so. I think uh, I signed up for a lot of newsletters. Uh, I spend a lot. I follow a lot of people on Twitter who talk relevant things. And you know, when you, I think these are the two channels that I spend a lot of time on, right? So there are a few newsletters that are just dedicated to tech, that are just like dedicated to new trends that are coming up, especially in the startup ecosystem. You know, there are a lot of people right now who are uh, talking about all the new developments in the business world, all the new tech that's out there. I think just going through those, maybe show you spend at least one, one and a half hours a day just reading through uh, some of these newsletters, reading through some people's tweets, and sharing that information in groups. I feel like that's how you kind of keep up with the updates. So um, in our case, one of the things we had was we had uh, a, a WhatsApp group uh, with you know all PMs. Uh, and, and, uh, and our boss at it, in it, right? So when we read something interesting, we would send that article over and share it with the rest of the group, right? And some things like, let's say, chat GPT just blow out of proportion, it's hard to miss. But, uh, you know, but like Elon Musk, uh, uh, you know, uh, finding a new CEO, 
those are things that you know you would find out over time. Uh, but the smaller things, uh, I would suggest you know sign up for these newsletters, uh, and maybe after this uh, uh, discussion, I can kind of give you a list of newsletters that I personally really like. <laughs> Jira or uh, how? That I think she is. Uh, but the are one thing, but then I think we have to stay updated with the technology also because a lot of disruptive technologies yeah. are coming up. Yeah. yeah. So, from a tool standpoint, ma'am, I feel like those are tools. Uh, they are there to solve a problem. So, once you know what problem you want to solve and once you understand how the tool functions, it, I mean, uh, just think it around for a bit and I feel like it's easy enough to uh, kind of, you know, start using it the right way. And even if it's not, uh, you know, very intuitive, I know Jira can be a pain sometimes. <laughs> Just, you know, reach out to someone. This is where the be curious part comes in. Right? Reach out to somebody who knows how to use it. Uh, ask them for a favor, you know, take them out for coffee and say, hey, can you just show me how this is done? And I've seen most of the times people oblige. Uh, people are genuinely really nice out there, unless of course not to be, but uh, most of the times I think people can help. Hi. Yeah? Hi, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, inputs. I actually had a question, you just uh, highlighted how you should be a problem solver rather than a problem finder. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, very early on in my career, I'm a sales or program manager, and what I've figured out is that is every problem that I identify, is that my problem to solve, or where, where do we draw the line between going to the manager and brainstorming solutions with him, uh, with them, versus uh, just uh, bringing solutions to them, let's say I, I found this problem, ABC is the solution to it. So what is the line there? Right. So I feel like that is a very, uh, it, it depends on the kind of relationship that you share with your manager. Uh, what I would suggest is, you know, for the initial few times, uh, maybe come up with the most optimal solution that you think makes the most sense, right? You give up the problem statement and you say, hey, you know what, this is a problem that I've been facing and I think these are, this is the way we can solve it. Uh, and hypothetically, let's say it involves a lot of tech, the solution, right? What you can do is, you know, this is going to take time. In the intermediate, here is how I plan to do it. You know, maybe I'm going to use some uh, task management software. I'm going to do XYZ things so that my life is easier. But I think the optimum solution needs to look like this final version of it. And take it to a manager, get their feedback, see how they respond. And I think most cases, uh, unless you know, the solution really doesn't make sense to them, they would like the fact that you took that initiative. Unless you know the solution is really off and it doesn't map back to a problem statement, I think most managers would be happy that you took that initiative and would probably start giving you more and more responsibility in that same sense. Right. Thank you. That's a very different, I mean, I don't know how I would answer that particularly. I would use reason, but you've already tried that. Um, yeah, maybe you tell them that, okay, you know what, uh, let's run an experiment. Maybe you could do it experimentally, right? Uh, you could say, hey, why don't we try this as an experiment with one batch uh, and cut down on the curriculum a little bit uh, or speed through it, or I don't know how it works, but maybe do X, Y, Z things so that the time is shorter. And at the end of it, if you feel that, or if the students or, or whoever you're training, if the trainees feel like they've gotten away with as much information as the other batches have, then sure, let's do it. If not, then we do it my way. I think that's one way to also sort of, uh, you know, uh, have a conversation where you say, I'm going to give you data to prove uh, whether A is working or B is work working. Does that make sense? I have tried that. Okay. 
So then I think you need to sit down and understand from him why he thinks it's not working. I think there you need to have a different conversation with him to understand why he feels it's not working and what is not working and how you can fix that. I, I don't know if it's a time problem at the end of the day. It's probably something else that he feels is not working out that well. But I think you should take this offline, maybe uh, probably a larger conversation. Yeah. Um, can you take it a little later? There's two more slides to go. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, right. So here are some of the challenges. I think we discussed this in the pre-conference uh, setup as well. Uh, I just thought you know, it's interesting because um, I honestly feel like these are things that we as women tend to feel more often than men do. Um, and again, I'm generalizing a bit here. I'm sure not everybody falls in that purview, but I still want to call out how I felt uh, along my journey. So I think everybody knows what imposter syndrome is, but I'm going to quickly still tell you what it is. Uh, it's this whole feeling you get when you feel that you've landed in your place by mistake. You slipped through some crack. You're not supposed to be here. You're not worthy of it, right? I can go on, but that's the gist of it, right? Uh, and I honestly feel that most of the women I've spoken to have felt like this at some point or the other in their lives. Um, so putting it out there, you're not alone. All of us have felt it, right? And um, I think the way you want to sort of tell yourself, or the way you want to sort of calm your nerves down whenever you feel the imposter and you're taking over is, I may have got here by mistake, but I'm not staying here by mistake, right? No one's going to not call me out if I'm not doing my job well. There's a reason why I'm here and I'm still here. Keep that in mind, right? And you will realize that uh, whatever built up confusion you have, whatever built up um, doubts you have, they're not yours. They're, they're just there to sort of scare you and say, okay, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to sit back and take it easy. Do not do that. Uh, the second thing is, at least uh, in my case, I was uh, directly reporting into the president and the co-founder. Uh, I didn't have anybody. He didn't have time for me. So I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anybody to look up to. I didn't have a role model. And initially, you know, when I transitioned from a senior team to a director, I would keep reaching out to my boss and saying, hey, you know what? I don't know what to do. Like, what am I supposed to do as a director? How is my job any different from what I was doing earlier? And he would keep trying to explain something to me which didn't sit in my head. I think one of the things he kept telling me was, you know what? There's no magical beans here. You don't find. Uh, but you want to use other people's help. Uh, what he was indirectly trying to tell me was deliberate. Right? Uh, when he kept saying, you know, you've got five teams at your disposal, use their help. Uh, I kept you know, thinking, you know, using their help, they're the ones who are doing stuff. Like, what, what is it that I need to do? What I didn't understand was him telling me you're not delegating enough. Right? Um, but the larger point here is that don't look for a role model, don't wait for a role model, right? You have to define your own path. Uh, maybe one way of looking at it could be you could reach out to other people with similar experiences, talk to them, understand from them what did they do when they were in a position similar to yours. Shadow someone who's in the position that you're currently in. Spend time, there are a lot of thought leaders out there. There are a lot of people, especially in product manager, management, you find like millions of literature out there, right? So just spend some time, scan through the noise, find the stuff that makes sense to you. Then right? figure out how you want to do this. Uh, don't lie, like, don't, don't get scared because you don't have someone above you. I'll give you an example. I have uh, this woman who used to work on my team as a content manager. Um, and I was overseeing the content with her. I was managing her, so she would always come to me for, uh, you know, uh, getting stuff checked, etc. And then we would push it out. Um, she quit and she moved on. And a couple of years later, she decided to join uh, another company as a content manager. And she reached out to me and she's like, you know what? There's nobody going to be managing you. I'm going to be doing this all by myself. There's no one who's going to tell me what to do. There's no one who's going to strategize for me. I have to do everything on my own. I said, that's great. She said, no, but I can't do it. I've never done it. I said, yeah, but you have to start somewhere. And she was like, but what if I'm not good at it? And, and I'm not even joking. I think of all the content managers I've ever worked with, she was the brightest I've worked with, and I think she's the fastest growing person I've ever met. And I learned a lot from her. I think she taught me more than I could have ever taught her. Right? And I told her that. I said, why do you feel like you can't do this? Like, the amount I've learned from you, I don't think I've learned from anybody else when it comes to content. You can do this. If there's anybody who can, you can. And I think for her, that was enough at that point of time. But her fear was very valid. But she said, I will not have a role model. I will not have 
someone who will be guiding me, etc. So when you know that person to somebody else, uh, don't look for your own model, you are already there. Uh, believe in yourself, it, it kind of ties back to the imposter syndrome. Believe in yourself and always aim for higher. Like if you think that you're here, aim to be working at this level. Like while you're here, work at this level. And I'm pretty sure most of us can do it. Uh, third, I was like made mistakes, uh, big mistakes. Uh, we launched a new product and our conversions dipped by 50% and I had zero idea that that had happened on a Saturday. Uh, my boss calls me up and he's like, so what's the conversion rate today? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. He's like, really? He's like, it's gone down 50%. You should be on top of this. Why do you not know this? I'm like, I haven't checked today. He said, I don't care. That's not my problem. When you launch a product that's going to impact your conversions, you better be on top of it. Right? It was really hard conversation, but I'm lucky that I had a boss who was willing to share feedback on the go, uh, and I wasn't like one of those bosses who waited like you know every six months or every year to share feedback. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is make a mistake, it's fine, but learn from it. Don't repeat it. Go back, reflect on what went wrong, and make a note of it so that it doesn't happen again. I work with people who keep on making the same mistakes again. <laughs> Don't be that big person. Right? Make sure that you know what you're doing wrong and you try and fix it and it doesn't happen again. Um, the last bit uh, wasn't really a challenge. I think it's more of an internal fight that I personally had all my life and I don't have a solution for it. I don't know how you solve for it. I'm still struggling with it. But I'm going to put it out there so all of you are aware that if you face the same things, you're not alone in this. Uh, a lot of times I sort of um, try and, you know, like we've all been culturally been conditioned to think, don't do this like a girl, don't look like a girl, or don't be girly. You know, girly is supposed to be, it's always been kind of looked down on as something that's not so nice, right? So when I entered uh, Casa One, I was very conscious of that. You know, I would dress up a little manly. Uh, I would try to match drink for drink at every party. Um, I would, you know, if I'm not feeling well, I would still show up and stand on my feet, uh, you know, through the entire day and uh, end the day like that. And if we're all sit, you know, if, if everyone's standing, there's no way I'm going to sit down, right? So I feel like sometimes you tend to take the fight on the opposite end, where you know you try to be the, you try to be like a guy, you know, like you'd be like one of the guys. Um, take a pause, ask yourself why, right? Is you having the same number of shots as your boss going to impact how you work with him? No, he doesn't care, right? Or are you dressing up maybe in a skirt going to change how your boss looks at you when you're working with him? No, I didn't eat your mouth. And you don't want to be in a company where it does, right? So think, stop, ask yourselves, why am I doing this? Why is it, why is this fear in me? Is it because somebody is hinted like that? Or is it because you know I feel that the culture around me is toxic? Or is it me? And if it's you, try to change that. If it's the company, definitely change that, right? So those are the four things that I need to highlight. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, I believe, because we have a larger panel on this. But uh, yeah. So I just wanted to share a few of my insights from when I interviewed people, as well as from when I've mentored uh, other women. Um, first of all, when I was hiring for product managers, one of the things, uh, and this is two years from two years back, one of the things that starkly jumped out at me was for every 20 to 30 male resumes that I saw, there was only one female resume. And uh, this is not hardcore data, this is back of the envelope, right? I would literally have to filter, I would apply filters and say female and see how many resumes I got. And again, the ratio was abysmal. Like for one female, there was probably 20 to 30 men applying for the job. Uh, the other thing is when I would reach out to men, uh, even if they were not looking out for a job, they were happy to explore the opportunity. They would want to know what you're about, uh, you know, what you have to offer, what is it that you do. Uh, when I would talk to the women, all of them would be like, hey, I'm, I'm happy. I don't want to, uh, you know, talk to you. I'm done. Uh, and and my, I'm included in this, right? The last four years I worked at Casa One, maybe few people have reached out and I've always turned them down, right? So uh, there's, there's that big difference there. Again, there's, there's no problem, there's no challenge. It's something that all of us should be aware of. Uh, it's something that the market is sort of trying to tell you. You know, when we say that only 39% of product managers are women, it's not because people are not hiring, it's also because women are not applying. The other thing that jumped out very starkly was if you look at uh, the resumes, if you compare the man and the female resume, 
uh, let's say the, both of them have same amount of experience. Both of them have worked five years. The men have like four different jobs. The women, two. Look at my resume. Like I've been working for 12 years, three jobs, right? Most of the women don't like changing their jobs is what I've observed, right? Uh, if you've worked for five years, possibly you're still on your second job. Right? Uh, but if you look at the men's resume, five years, four jumps. Right? They have to do that. They don't care. And while they're on the fourth jump, while they've taken a fourth offer, they're probably interviewing at five other places. We don't do that, right? Um, again, uh, I think you need to be a little selfish here, I think, um, for your own personal growth, uh, for making sure you have your options open. And, uh, you know, if, if, let's say, something is giving you a better, uh, not just financially, but uh, overall from a professional standpoint, if you find something that's better than what you do today, then why not? Mm -hmm. Since you have been hiring for quite a time, um, would you not see this as a major when you see a person with a lot of jobs versus a person with a few? Um, not anymore, honestly. Not anymore. Because I think. Now I see it as a tourist, you know, like earlier. You would say that, hey, you know, you have to be loyal to a company, keep working, keep working. It doesn't work like that anymore. If you don't enjoy working at a place, it's okay to look out. And typically when you're uh, screening, that is one of the questions you would ask. So if let's say somebody's worked five years and had seven jobs, I would be concerned then. You know, you haven't managed to spend one entire year at any company. Why? I would ask that question. That would be a concern for sure. But someone with five years and four jobs, I think, it's okay. I mean, I would try to understand why first. You also had a question. Yeah. Your first question. Yeah. My question is, uh, when you're looking for a job, mm -hmm. in comparison to experience, how important is the certification? And if yes, is it an important thing? What are the kind of skills you look for? Um, honestly, I think it totally depends on the company that you're applying to. Um, for instance, in my case, I would not look at any of those. I don't look at what school you're from, uh, you know, if you have an MBA or not, what companies you work for. Uh, we would look for things that would jump out, you know, something that sets you apart from the rest of the resumes. Maybe you've got your own, um, I don't know, blog, which has maybe 20,000 views a month, uh, and you're very active in you know, having some discussions on it, that sets you apart, right? Uh, you look for cues, right? But I'm pretty sure that's not true for the entire industry. Uh, there might be some importance to certifications that are placed uh, in, in some segments, but I, I believe startups are generally a little bit more flexible in terms of how they're hiring. <laughs> Okay, uh, the last part, again, uh, this is going back to, you know, the content manager that I was talking about. Uh, this is, I'm going to use her example again. When she was looking for this new job, when she was look, looking to switch, uh, she didn't have the confidence in herself. And that's something that's come across more in women than men. When you tell a man who's super confident, oh, I've never done this, I can do this better than you can in five days, right? When you talk to a woman, she'd be like, but hey, I don't know, I haven't done this, would I be able to do it? I'm not sure, would I get some help? You know, so there's a lot of hesitation over there. So if you're one of those people, try and get over it. Uh, and the way you would do it is fake it, <laughs> right? If you feel underconfident, it's fine. You just don't have to go up and say it out loud, right? Tell them, hey, you know what? I can do it, give me a chance. Okay. So that's my takeaway, and uh, I hope you guys found uh, something of value here. Yeah. Hi. I'm actually uh, because when you're going to for example, But the first one in itself was very product oriented. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I came across was that the more that I knew the product, the longer that I stayed, the better, uh, at least as a woman, that I could talk to my male colleagues, make better decisions, sort of have the upper hand, uh, in, upper hand in the meeting, sort of make better decisions altogether for the product. Yeah. So I wonder if there's something to be said about staying longer at a job because we are women, because we tend to be overlooked when it comes to decisions. Um, that would be a thought. Yeah, no, so I'm not advocating that we switch jobs faster. I'm in no way saying that you know you should 
aim to be doing that, you know, get five different jobs in five years. That's not what I meant. I said, this is one of my observations from the resumes that we had, right? Uh, again, you're right, uh, the longer you spend with the product, the more you know about it, but you also get industrialized into that thinking, right? Which is also fine, like there is a sweet spot, you have to figure out what works for you. So that's kind of where I'm always confused, which is, uh, do you think, like from your experience, do you think there would be more value for me to find from uh, having switched industries four times in product, having seen like different systems, or staying in one particular niche? What would be your Got it. just so, take? Okay, so again, I think this boils down to what you want. Uh, what is your goal out of all of this, right? So if you're happy in the industry that you're working in, maybe don't switch, right? But if you feel like you're not getting the best out of it, you're not enjoying your work, then you can go ahead and experiment with other industries, get a hang of it, try and figure out how it works. Um, totally depends, totally up to you how you know, you're enjoying the work that you're currently doing. Does that make sense? I, I don't think from an outsider standpoint it's better or worse. Uh, from an outsider standpoint, sure, if I'm a furniture company, probably somebody who's worked out of a Lenko or an Urban Ladder would be more appealing as a candidate to me, right? But, uh, you know, when a push comes to show, when I'm actually talking to the candidate, when I'm actually interviewing the candidate, if they're not good, they're not good. It doesn't matter that they're from the same industry. Whereas if I'm talking to somebody from a different industry, uh, maybe, you know, uh, it was easier for, uh, for the Felenko person to get shortlisted for an interview versus someone from, let's say, uh, Rezepe, hypothetically, right, because of the difference in industries. Uh, probably it was easier for the person at Felenko to get their foot in the door, but if they're not good, they're not good, uh, versus if, let's say, the Rezepe PM is good, they're good. I mean, end of the day, it all, it's a very transferable skill. That, that actually helps, because, like, I've shifted industries a lot, and I'm like, I'm actually scattered, right? Maybe people would really like that, you know, because you've got so much experience and they're like, hey, you know what, she can do whatever you throw at her. I mean, again, it depends on the person interviewing. Interviews are also very uh, luck-based at certain times, right? Like, it also depends on how your interview is feeling, how you're feeling on that day, uh, you know, what kind of people they've spoken to in the past. There's a lot of other things at play. So I, I wouldn't want to generalize. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. I have a question for that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, you're saying that uh, for product managers, uh, the industry, you know, does not really matter as much. Okay. Like, you know, so specifically about the industry, what is the domain knowledge of the product manager should have to be a good one if the domain knowledge is important? So, domain knowledge is definitely one. She's got two years of experience, right? But if you've, let's say, done seven years in e-commerce, I'm assuming it would be difficult for you to switch. Right? Like, I mean, you can't just put your hands up and say that, hey, I'm going to switch from e-commerce and do X, Y, Z. You can do it, right? But it's not really as easy as it would be for someone with just two years of experience put out there, right? Uh, other things, I think, um, again, depending on where you're uh, trying to find a job, if you're looking at a startup or you're looking at larger organizations, um, and who's screening your resumes? <laughs> Right, if it's a hiring manager or if it's, uh, let's say, someone from the recruitment team, right? Uh, I've seen that recruitment teams typically focus on markers like, you know, MBA Kia, what school, uh, what kind of companies are you from? If you work, let's say, Microsoft and Google on your resumes, you're happy. <laughs> I'm going to struggle with a job hunt because I don't have anything other than my B school that kind of shows through, right? So I think end of the day, what really matters is getting your foot into the door. Uh, and I'm a big advocate for this, use your contacts. Skills, okay, so, so we're talking about the actual conversation, the, the interview, not the screening part of it, yeah. So again, it depends on the uh, uh, level that you're interviewing for. So if you're going in for a PM or a senior PM kind of a position, then you need to know your basics. You know, your hygiene needs to be in place. Uh, a lot of the bigger companies want to talk about processes, they want to talk about um, how do you prioritize, right? They literally ask you that question, how do you prioritize, right? And you have to give them real examples from your experience. Uh, you can't just, you know, say, hey, you know what, I follow rice method and do this, I apply that, it didn't work, <laughs> right? So you have to give them real life examples. So they want to know the basics. So, yeah, so sorry, let me break it down. So when you're looking at PM, senior PM, and when you're interviewing the larger companies, they know process oriented. They want to see how you react in situations. They have case studies. And over there, they understand how you work a problem, 
right? Are you somebody who understands who goes deeper into the problem and breaks it down and then comes up with a solution, or are you somebody who automatically jumps to the solution, right? So they're going to look at your soft skills. Mostly. I don't care. So if let's say I'm giving you a yes or no question. I don't care what your answer is. I want to see how you arrived at that answer. What is your process? What is your method? Right? Uh, now, if you look at larger companies, they want you to follow a process. So when I say they want you to follow a process, you should know how to prioritize, and you should be able to put it down in words that this is how you prioritize. You should be able to tell them, I had five conflicting priorities. This is what I did. When they ask you how do you manage your stakeholders, you should be able to tell them how you manage your stakeholders, right? So larger companies have a set number of questions. They'll have a point system where they grade you on these parameters, right? Whereas smaller companies or startups are more flexible. Like personally, when I've interviewed or when I see my husband is also in a startup interview, it's more about how smart you are. How much can you adapt? How much can I throw at you and how much can you pick up? Right? So I don't care if you know how to prioritize or not. I don't care if you know how to write a PRD or not. Those are things you're going to learn on the job. And I'm okay teaching you that. I'm okay mentoring you that. Are you smart? If I tell you to do something, will you push back and say, no, this doesn't make sense. This is better. Right? I need people like that. You don't need yes men. You don't need yes women. You need people who can challenge you, who are smarter than you are, and who don't care so much about process, but about getting things done. So again, to sort of boil it down, uh, large companies versus startups. Large companies want process. They want you to be smart as well, uh, but also more structured in your thoughts, whereas with smaller companies, they're a little bit more flexible. So uh, the question is twofold. Uh, like you spoke about managing up, right? And also about um, having a background education, company, whatever. So, um, so having a... Um, so um, the thing is, uh, at uh, my company, so there are many people from the IIMs and ISBs. Uh, it's at at some point in time, it becomes difficult to convince people uh, from the work that you've done because they would not have as much context also. Uh, but when you, have, uh, when you have to get something done or when you have to uh, prove a point, right? Uh, at many, many a times, it becomes that I prove with data, but they can just speak and then it gets done. It gets done that way. So I wanted to understand like what are some of the skills that we can use in terms of uh, maybe influencing and or overcoming their bias so that uh, it's easier to get things done than like just getting uh, over through like the whole process, uh, get, um, get people on board and the time goes, right? So I work in a startup. So we use time uh, and it's like time loss is money loss for us right now. Uh, so uh, what are some of the skills to like manage up plus uh, like not having a degree but having the experience uh, like how, how yeah. to prove that? So I think this goes back to the first point, right? Uh, I, I don't have complete context, but I think building relationships as a product manager is very, very important, right? Uh, what I mean by that is you have to... I accept your point that probably you have to put in more effort in that front. Uh, again, it depends on who's who you're talking to, etc. Right? It shouldn't be that way. And I've seen in a lot of cases it's not, but for some reason it is in yours, right? I think what you need to do is you need to start building up a new relationship with your stakeholders, where they trust you. Uh, where you go up to them and tell them that, hey, you know what? Uh, this is why we should do this, uh, and this is why we need to do this, right? That part is something that maybe you can try working on uh, and see if that helps you. Okay, uh, we'll take one last question and I think then we can take the conversation with tea. Yes. Oh, yeah, so I think I'm audible now. So uh, when you're switching an industry or when you're looking for an industry switch, how much weight do you give into the fact that what is the future of that industry? Given some more context, I work in EV right now and I want to switch and I want to look into more industries because I've not explored that. But then given the fact that EVs are going to be the future, like, you know, you ha how much weight do you give, give to the fact that what industry you're trying to switch in, will it have a future going five years forward or not? So do you really consider that fact when you, like, you know, you're thinking of a future for yourself? 
first question are you happy working in EV? Yes. Yeah. I, okay. So, one, that should be the highest rate according to me. That's the principle I follow, right? Uh, in terms of whether you should look at the future, of course. I mean, you don't want to, let's say, you know, um, let's take we work as a hypothetical example, right? Like, uh, they were supposed to help you, then there was a lot of noise around some misappropriation of funds and things can go as planned, right? Uh, knowing what you know about WeWork, would you go to WeWork? No. Right? Because you know that there's something bad that's about to fall. Similarly with the industry, I think crypto is in a turmoil right now uh, because of FX or whatever reason, right? Uh, but does it mean that it's not going to go up? Nobody knows. It could stay, it could fall, it could go up, it could come under regulation, whatever. There are so many possibilities, right? But does it excite you? If it excites you, then go ahead, give it a shot. What's the worst that's going to happen? Fine, you will go down, you will lose a job maybe, but you will get back on your feet and you will find another job. Right? So think about what makes sense, or what, what makes you happy, uh, where you would want to go. And definitely, I mean, if it's already on the downside, like, be a little cautious about it, but if you still feel like, you know, this is something that I really, really want to do, then go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, for this exciting and engaging session. And we could see that the audience is really engaged, but we still have a lot more for the day. And thank you, Nana, for joining us as a keynote speaker for today's conference. It was an immense pleasure having you here. And please, uh, please accept the token of appreciation from the Institute.